was preaching the gospel, we think, oh, that's commitment. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd be able to do that. But I'm going to tell you this morning that that same Jesus that they serve and that they're willing to die for is that same Jesus that we serve here in the United States. Same Jesus. Just do it. A slogan that uh, Nike has, has put out, and has been out for many years, and the idea of just do it gives us a little picture of, man, going out there and uh, giving it all your gusto, whether you run, whether you uh, play football, whether you play basketball, any type of sport. And it seems like you watch those commercials, you watch those athletes, you think, man, wouldn't I give anything to kind of be like that, you know, to, to really put myself out there? And we go, we purchase the stuff, we get the bands, we get the shoes, we get the shorts, and we get the shirt. We even, uh, you know, get some of that compression shirt to make it feel like, wow, we're tight, yeah. But in actuality, we wind up going out, we go and do it, and it's like, especially in January. When, you know, we, we, we come to, to January 1st, and, oh, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out there, and I'm going to try and lose 10 pounds, lose this many pounds, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna uh, to look ripped in a couple of months. Day two, and it's like all the stuff starts getting, uh, being placed in the, in the garage or down in the basement or up in the, up in the attic. And, uh, you know, you don't, you don't see that until uh, December 25th where you start taking out the stuff for, uh, for Christmas. You say, oh, man, look, I got my stuff here. You know what? I'm going to start again. And we wind up being kind of like this. I wish it would play, but it doesn't play. Uh, we kind of run out of gas and, oh, you know, we can't do this. Ah, forget about it. We take a couple of steps and we're already out of breath. And sometimes we kind of treat the same way with, with sermons and uh, Sunday school. You know, we get all excited about what we hear. Two weeks ago uh, or a week ago, we had uh, uh, Brother Guy kind of share uh, the three circles and, you know, some tidbits of tools that we could use. And I thought, man, these, this is good stuff. You know, stuff that, you know, add to my arsenal. And then I started to think, you know what? Sometimes we as, as, uh, as preachers or as teachers, uh, I wonder how many of our listeners get excited and ready to do and get, you know what, I want to do it. Just do it. I want to believe in Jesus and I'm going to go out there and do it. But then the, the little doubt starts coming and the little voice says, you can't do it. Hey, you can't do it. The little voice over here tells you, you remember last week what you did. Remember what you saw. And everything goes down the tubes. All the things that we wanted to do, that we wanted to serve Jesus, kind of just gets like, like this guy. We run out of breath. And we don't want to do it. Paul shared something that was really key for our lives, that we can do it, that it is possible. In Galatians 2.20, this is my favorite verse. This is my favorite verse. Uh, and I've looked over it, and I've torn it apart. And so this morning, I want to tear it apart for you, all right? Because I want you to see that Paul bought the whole store. He went, and he bought all of the equipment. He went, and he got everything. It may have been on clearance, or it may have been uh, uh, not on sale, but he brought the whole store. He says, I'm going to follow Jesus because I know I can do this. Not because of my power. Not because uh, I have the skill. But I want to be everything that Jesus said that we can possibly be. 
And so this morning, I want to share with you three, three things that we know that we can do it. All right? Three, three truths that are taught here about just do it. We have that ability because Christ has given us that ability. And it's all in found in this one verse. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. As we delve into your word, I just pray that you open our hearts and our minds, that you make us excited, that you make us uh, gather in what you have in store for us today. But I pray that we don't store it up in our storage uh, banks, in our storage department, and let it gather dust like our equipment, that we can take it and use it and share it with those that are on their last thread of doubts, their last thread of, oh, I just can't live the Christian life, but they can share this one little verse that has so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, how is this possible? How is it that we can live the Christian life? What do we need to do? Well, the first thing we have to realize is that we have a position in Christ. All right? Do you realize that now in Christ you have a better position? Do you realize that? Before coming to Christ, we had no position. Our only position was death. Our only position was going to hell. That was our position. And so Paul wanted to make sure that we got it right. And he told us this is what we need to realize. We need to realize our past position. Well, what are you talking about, Joe? What, what do you mean past position? Notice at the very beginning of the verse it says, I have been what? I have been crucified. And what Paul is trying to communicate is letting us know that the same time that that Jesus was crucified, when we came to know Christ, guess what? We were crucified as well. We died to our sins. We died to that old life, never to wake up again. And the best example of that is when we get baptized. Remember when you got baptized? Remember, remember that, uh, that event? If you've never been baptized, let me give you a quick, quick overview. You're taken into the water. And as you're taken into the water, you're not sprinkled. You don't get a cup and put it over your water. You put water on yourself. You're taken into the water. You're buried in the water. It covers you. That's what baptism means. It doesn't mean dip. It means to put into. And that what symbolizes is death. The death to the old life. And so Paul is telling us right here and right now that that same crucifixion that Jesus suffered is the same what we need to do with our own lives. We need to just crucify it. Leave it dead. Never to rise again. I have been crucified with Christ. And in some version it says it, it's in the past tense. And that's, and that's true. Because it's a one-time event. Has Jesus been crucified again? Has Jesus been crucified again? No. It happened how many times? One. It happened one time. Now internalize this. Imagine. When you came to Christ, you put to death all of those things that made you go against God, that made you an enemy. Romans 5.1 tells us that we have peace with God. The opposite of peace is what? War. 
So we were at war with God. And as such, all the things that displeased him now get crucified. You're probably thinking, well, how do you do that? Oh, I'm going to share that with you because it's found here too. But not only do we have to realize our past position, we also have to realize our present position. And it's found in that same verse. Read it with me. I've been crucified with Christ. I what? No longer live. I no longer live. That means right now. All my decisions, who do they belong to? Don't be afraid. Say it. Jesus. All my thoughts belong to who? The Bible tells us that we were bought with a price. We are no longer ourselves. We no longer belong to us. So if Jesus paid the price for us when he died on that cross, don't you think that we owe it to him to live as he asks us to live? When you go buy a product... And it says, oh, it does this. You take it home and it doesn't do that. What are you, what are you going to do? You're going to take it back. You say, hey, th this product doesn't do what you said, what you promised. Oh, but Jesus is not going to do that with you. Jesus is not going to go return you. Yeah, think about it. He's not going to go back and return you because it cost him What? What did it cost him? It cost him his life. He's not going to want to return you because he loves you. He loves each one of us. What does John 3.16 say? For God so what? Hated the world? What do you, for God so what? Louder. He loved. He loved. And sometimes I don't understand that love. And maybe I just don't want to understand that love. But one thing I do want to know is that he loves me. And I echo Paul's uh, words when he says, I'm the worst of sinners. Romans 5.8 tells us that God demonstrated his love toward us that we were yet what? Sinners. He what? Died. Wow. So as Christians, we need to realize our position in Christ. And as Christians, we need to live that life because he bought us with a price. The second thing that we need to realize is that we need to rely on the power of Christ. All right? Not only do we have to, not only do we have to realize our position in Christ, we've got to see and rely on that power that he's given us. The same power that our brothers and sisters are suffering from across the world is the same type of power that we have each and every single day. This past week, I had a chance to, to share the circles. Um, and as I was sharing the circles, the person said, this, this sounds real familiar. And I go, well, yeah, this, this, is, this is the gospel. Well, I have heard the gospel, but I've never heard it this way. And I go, yeah, I had never heard it this way either. But I want, I want to finish sharing it so that you can have the full picture. Yeah, I keep going. This is, this is easy. I had another opportunity to share it with someone else, and, and, and they told me, I had never heard it this way. It, it always seems that when people try and share it, it sounds so difficult. And I told them, it's, it's, it's simple. The gospel is so simple that sometimes we try and come up with ways of making it more difficult for individuals to understand it. But it's because we try and do the work of the Lord using our own knowledge, 
and using our own power, using our own tricks. And Paul did it. If you know, if you read it through throughout the uh, Acts, he did it with simplicity. When we rely on his power, we're actually relying on the resurrection. That resurrection power that Jesus defeated when he rose from the grave. Notice, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ what? Christ lives. All this month, all this month um, for the early service, I've been focusing on Christ's resurrection. And I've had a couple of people say, why do, why do we keep singing, uh, you know, resurrection hymns? And I go, because it's alive! Right? I mean, that's, that's, my, that's my take on it. He's alive! All I can tell you is Buddha's still dead. I can tell you Confucius is still dead. But Jesus' grave is empty. Jesus' grave has no body in it. That's why Christ lives. And he makes sure to tell us that we have that same power. We have that same ability to be able to rise from the dead. The Bible tells us, uh, just as Jesus rose from the grave, uh, different then when he was buried, everyone that comes by faith is forever, ever altered. What does 2 Corinthians 5.17 say? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? He's a new creation, new creature. In other words, never been before. Metamorphi, something that's totally different. The best example is the butterfly. What was a butterfly before it became a beautiful butterfly? What was it? It was a worm. He crawled on the ground. <laughs> That's what we were. We crawled on the ground. We were ground crawlers. Until Jesus came and he saved us. And now we're beautiful butterflies. <laughs> you may think I'm kind of far-reaching, but it's not. That's a total transformation. That's a type of transformation that ought to be uh, exhibited now that we are followers of Christ. And not only do we have that, uh, that power of resurrection, we also have the power of his residency. <laughs> Hey, what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean, Joe? Power is residence. <laughs> Notice, Christ lives where? Where does he live? Say it. In me. Why would an all-powerful, marvelous God choose to live in me? Think about it. He created everything in this world, in this universe, and he picks me? In 2 Corinthians, it tells us that he's made residence, that we are a temple of the what? Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, God only resided far away from his people, up in the mountain. And only one could ever approach him. And as he established the sacrificial system, there was only one individual that would come, and that was the high priest. And he'd only come one time a year. But we can go every single day, every single minute. We don't have to wait in line. We don't have to set an appointment. We don't have to go to somebody else and say, hey, can you pray for me? Can you go talk to God? No. We have access to God. He lives in us. He lives 
in me. And so Paul is communicating to us that when we rely on his power, he gives us the ability to not fear death, and he gives us the ability to have the Holy Spirit live in us. I, w- I want to take you here. In John 14, 16, it says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you. And beware. And beware. He's going to be with you. All right? He's going to be with you. Now, is it only going to be for uh, 30 minutes or maybe half an hour or, or maybe half a day? It's going to be half for how long? Forever. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's forever. It's forever. I mean, <laughs> gosh, forever? I always think of forever as, as, as a picture like this. I picture forever like this. Think of a butterfly. Think of one butterfly taking a grain of sand from here to the moon. All right? And as that butterfly transverses from here to the moon, taking that one grain of sand back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. How long do you think that would take? I would go like this. Woo! Well, when he gets done, when that butterfly gets done, eternity is just beginning. Eternity is just beginning. So he lives in us forever. And I can only imagine, I can only imagine that when we get to heaven, that relationship that we're going to have straight through with Jesus, with God, the Holy Spirit, all together at one time. And then verse 18, it says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. He is part of your life. So when we rely on the power of Christ... And when we realize our, uh, realize our position in Christ, that we come to our last idea that Paul kind of shares. By resting in the provisions of Christ. What does that mean? What is Paul trying to communicate in that? Yes, we have our position. And it's all because of Christ, not because of us. We didn't do anything to earn it. All right? And we rely on his power. Well, guess what? Just like he doesn't want to leave us orphans, he's provided some, uh, some tools for us. And it's in the passage. All right? He supplies us with faith. I want you to read this. <laughs> read this. The life I now live in the body. In other words, right now, as you're sitting down right here, right? As you're sitting down right here, as you're sitting right there, right now, the life that you're living, you live, I live by faith in the Son of God. My brothers and sisters, he has deposited faith into our lives. We have no faith. We have none of that as part of us when we first came to know Christ. He's the one that gave us the faith. And as such, like it says, the life I now live should be a life of faith. I visited my mom yesterday. And uh, a couple of... uh, it's already been almost two years that uh, uh, she fell and uh, 
she broke her hip, and, uh, and she's not used to being, you know, she's not used to sitting down, to being still. She's always been working, as long as I can remember. And so she gets really antsy. And sometimes she cries because she wants to do those things that she was able to do before she fell. And I tell her, Mom, you not, don't trust your body. Your body's only here for a little while. I said, remember when you first trusted Christ? Remember the faith that you first got? Remember that, because that's what's going to pull you through. And she goes, I know, mijo, I know. And she cries, and she cries. I'm trying, I'm trying. I said, no, mom, don't try. Do. Do. I said, remember when you, uh, you were reading the Bible? Yes, I remember. I said, if I have to, I'm going to go and, and get a, um, uh, an MP3 with all the Bible. So that way you can listen to it and not have to worry because one of her eyes is giving her problems. And that way you can hear uh, the Psalms. That way you can hear uh, what, what Jesus spoke to the disciples when, when they were fearing, when they were anxious. Yes, Miko, that would be great. And that's what Paul is communicating with us this morning. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Where did that faith come from? Ephesians 8, 9. Remember that passage? You remember that passage? Ephesians 8, 9. In it, it says that the faith is a gift of God. It's a gift of God. God gave us that faith. And we received it. But it's up to us to keep holding on to that. And how do we hold on to that? Romans 10, 7. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of God. It's right there. So simple. We've got to hear the Word of God. And the last thing that uh, He provides us is the sacrifice of His flesh. I've been crucified with Christ. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who, notice, loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus sacrificed it all. Jesus gave us everything because of love. And so the question becomes, what are we willing to give? What are we willing to lay down? The Christian life, yeah, it's a struggle. I'm not, I'm not going to deny it. But he's given us the tools that we need to live the life that God expects us to live. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And this is a simple gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Simple gospel. That's all it is. And so the response, there are three responses. The first one, I don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus this morning, I can help you. I can help you find him. Or the person sitting next to you that invited you, they can help you. But someone can help you find Jesus.
this morning.